Hello, and welcome to chapter 13 on respiratory system disorders. So, um, yeah, I mean, we covered the heart, we've covered digestion, we've covered um, a lot of other things, and now we get to cover a little bit of the respiratory system. So the purpose and the general function of the respiratory system are, you know, we need to be able to transport the oxygen from the air that we breathe into the blood so that the hemoglobin can carry the blood and deliver it down into the myoglobin. The reason for this is because we need oxygen for cellular metabolism. So there's aerobic and there's anaerobic. Aerobic is with air. That's where we get a lot of energy from, for instance, one glucose molecule or fat or you know, protein. Or we have anaerobic, which is the one that happens when we're exercising, right? It's not very efficient, but it keeps us alive. One of the downfalls of it is it produces lactic acid, so then we have to take care of it blah, 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 et cetera. But the purpose and general function of the circulatory system is that we need to be able to breathe in oxygen, get it to where it needs to go, and also exhale carbon dioxide as waste um, from the blood. So the carbon dioxide is a waste product from metabolism. And there are two anatomical areas that we really need to point out here. The first is the upper respiratory tract, and we want to uh, point out the resident flora that reside here. And then the lower respiratory tract, and this part is sterile, okay, so we shouldn't have any microbes growing down there. <clears throat> um, the upper respiratory tract, this includes your nasal cavity, and the purpose of your nose is to warm and moisten air. And then also foreign material can be trapped by those mucal secre secretions. So for instance, I just got back from the barn, riding a horse, took a shower, right, and um, all that stuff. It was a little dusty today, so I bet you if I blow my schnoz that it'll be kind of brown because there's uh, dirt and dust that's trapped in there. And so that's a good thing because that means that my nose and the mucosal sec uh, secretions are catching those foreign materials so that they don't go further into my respiratory tract. You also have your nasal pharynx, and this is your pharyngeal tonsils that are on the posterior wall. Then you also have your palatine tonsils, and these are your lymphoid tissues that are in a posterior position of the oral cavity. Looking at the anatomy of the respiratory system, um, you know, you can see again your sinuses and all of that jazz, um, the nasal pharynx, the palatine, right, all of those things we were just talking this is figure 13.3 um, in your book on page 272. So again, you have your sinuses, you have your tonsils, you have your, um, your auditory ear opening, the nasal pharynx, the palatine tonsils are here, the laryngeal pharynx, your vocal cords, right? The esophagus, you can actually feel the trachea, like the ribbing in it. So feel your throat right now, that's kind of cool. Uh, your right lung, your left lung, because remember it's anatomical. And then going down into um, more detail, you have your alveolar duct, you have your alveolus, and they're made up of these tiny little sacs called alveolar sacs, and that would be in a respiratory bronchial. Um, continuing specifically with the upper respiratory tract, you have your oronopharynx, and this is the common passage for both air and food. And the epiglottis is really important because it protects the opening of the larynx. So as you swallow, right? Then you can feel that it happens, okay? And it closes over the glottis at the swallowing point in order to prevent aspiration. So basically things go down the right pipe. You know, if you eat something too fast, you drink something and it goes down the wrong pipe, oh, good Lord, it burns like a mother, right? And that's because you're getting that acidic food or whatever into an area that it's not supposed to be in and it causes a lot of inflammation and therefore pain. Um, <clears throat> your larynx has two pairs of vocal cords in it. And then you also have your trachea and this is lined by those pseudostratified ciliated epithelial cells. And these form C-shaped rings of cartilage. And again, those are the ones that you can feel if you, um, if you actually feel your throat area. The bronchial tree, um, it's basically continual branching. And so you have like a bronchial tree and then it goes down into very small little alveolar sacs. And so the trachea itself branches into the right and left primary bron bronchi. And then it branches further into the secondary bronchi. And then it goes into the bronchioles then the terminal bronchioles, the respiratory bronchioles, the alveolar ducts, then the alveoli. And those alveoli are these little tiny like 
spherical things. And these are lined by simple squamous epithelial cells. And um, they have a surfactant to reduce the surface tension and maintain inflation. And this is really important. So surfactants are like, you know, if you're using, if you're washing your dishes, right, and you put dish soap on it, the reason why dish soap works to clean dishes is it's a surfactant, right? So it, break, it breaks the surface tension of um, droplets and stuff like that so that it can go into smaller areas. And so um, what happens is babies that are born premature, the last thing to develop in the human body is actually your lungs. So many preemies or some babies that are not quite ready when they come out, even if they are full term, they're going to have a hard time breathing. And so the doctor is going to give them a surfactant to break up those that area so that they can breathe. So that's kind of cool. But anyway, these alveoli are going to be the end point for the inspired air. And also, this is the site of gas exchange. So they're very important. Um, ventilation, this is the process of inspiration and expiration. Inspiration is breathing in. Expiration is breathing out. Okay. And the airflow depends on uh, pressure gradient. And that's called Boyle's Law. The air always moves from a high pressure area to a lower pressure area. And um, because of this, also, um, the uh, atmospheric pressure is higher than the pressure in the alveoli. So because of that, that during inspiration, air is going to move from the atmosphere into the lungs, where when the pressure in the alveoli is higher than the atmosphere, then we exhale, and the air is going to move out from the lungs and back into the atmosphere. Um, so here is a uh, little table or picture that says uh, ventilation. And you can see this on page 276 of your book. Um, <coughs> it is figure 13.2. It says ventilation changes in pressure with inspiration and expiration. So um, up here in A, it's resting. And so it says that your atmospheric pressure is about 760 millimeters of mercury. You have your chest wall here. You have your inter interpleural space. The interpleural pressure is 756 millimeters of mercury, so a little bit lower. And then you have your intrapulmonic space, and this is 760 millimeters of mercury. And that would be the same as the pressure of the atmosphere. And again, this is where your diaphragm is. So then when we inspire, the diaphragm actually descends and goes down. So it's kind of opposite of what you would think, um, but it, it's really cool because it's like gonna pull the um, lungs kind of open. And then over here in step one, the muscles are gonna contract and the chest wall itself is gonna move out. And then the diaphragm two here descends or goes down. And then down here in three, the interpulmonic pressure becomes negative, and usually it becomes less than the atmosphere by about minus 758 millimeters of mercury. And then up here in four, the intrapleural pressure becomes more negative, and that's about 754 millimeters of mercury. And then because of that, here in step five, the air at 760 millimeters of mercury is going to flow into the trachea, and or bronchioles and uh, into um, the lungs itself. Down here in C, this would be expiration, so exhaling. And so here in one, the muscles relax, and then the chest wall is going to move inward, and then the diaphragm is going to go back up or is going to ascend. And then down here in three, the interpleural pressure remains negative. And then up here in four, the intrapulmonic pressure becomes positive, and that means it's greater than atmospheric pressure at 763 millimeters of mercury, and that causes us to push the air out. So that is the overview of um, ventilation. So with pulmonary volumes, the tidal volume is the amount of air exchanged with quiet inspiration and expiration. And then we have residual volume, and this is residual, right? It's the amount of air that's remaining in the lungs after maximum respiration. So if you go and you blow out, you still have a little bit of air left in there. You know, and that's kind of a good thing because you don't want like your alveoli sticking together and stuff like that, right? And you know, they're never fully deflated. You also have your vital capacity, and this is the maximum amount of air that can be moved in and out of the lungs with a single forced inspiration and expiration. So if I go, Measuring that would be your vital capacity. I've actually had pulmonary tests done, so I know lots about this, guys.
so much fun. Actually, I, they suck getting done, but that's okay. All right, so your pulmonary volumes here are in table 13.1, and this is on page 273. And so it's just going to describe your tidal volume is roughly around 500 millimeters, uh, milliliters, and this is the amount of air exiting the lungs with each normal breath. So it's about half of a liter, okay? The residual volume that's left in your lungs is 1.2 liters. Your inspiratory reserve is about three liters. And so this is the maximal amount of air that can be inhaled in excess to the normal quiet inspiration. You also have expiratory reserve, and that's just a little over a liter. And this is the maximal volume of air that's expired through a passive expiration. You have your vital capacity, which is about 4.6 liters, and this is the maximal amount of air expired or blown out following a maximum expiration. Inspiration, I'm sorry. And then you have your total lung capacity, which is about 5.8 liters, and this is the total volume of air in lungs after maximal inspiration. And so think about it, guys. All right, so this is like, I don't know, roughly a little bit less than a liter, right? Oh, this is a half of a liter. So think of a two liter bottle. You have almost three of those in total lung capacity. So I think that that's pretty cool. All right, uh, pulmonary volume. Again, this is a way that you can look at what we just talked about. This is in figure 13.3 on page 277. And so you here have here your normal inspiration, right, which is your total uh, tidal volume. You have your maximal and then inspiration, maximal expiration. You see that whatever's beyond that maximal expiration is going to be your residual volume. Uh, you have your expiratory reserve volume, your inspiratory reserve volume, your vital capacity of everything that you can breathe in and out, your inspirational capacity, your functional residual capacity, and then your total lung capacity. Again, you get six liters. So that's kind of a lot, but your lungs are huge. And actually, if you look at like the lungs of a horse, they're huge. It's like amazing how big they are. And like whales, do whales have lungs? Whales. Anyway, it's, yeah, they do because they can, yeah. Okay. So anyway, it's very, very cool. Um, so how do we control breathing or ventilation? Well, the primary control centers for breathing are located in the medulla and the pons, which is it back in your brainstem area. You have chemoreceptors, which are chemical receptors that detect changes in carbon dioxide level hydrogen ions, um, so for the pH scale, and also oxygen levels in blood or cerebral spinal fluid. And your central chemoreceptors are located in the medulla, where your peripheral chemoreceptors are located in the carotid bodies. When talking about respiratory control, um, uh, then this is going to be um, on page 278. Um, figure A, uh, figure 13.4, and um, this is A, which is the normal cycle. And so basically um, what happens is, um, for instance, if we stimulate the inspiratory muscles, we're going to increase your respiratory rate. When we're breathing more, it's going to remove more carbon dioxide from the body, therefore giving us decreased um, C PCO2. Uh, decrease chemoreceptor stimulation, slow your res your respirations back to normal, right? Retain more CO2 and then causing an increase in PCO2 in the blood and CNSF and then stimulating the central chemoreceptors in the medulla, right? So it keeps it in like this static normal cycle where we want things to be. So we have a, a ways that we can control how we breathe. And this is um, controlling a ventilation. You can have hypercapnia or you can have hypoxemia, okay? Hypercapnia means that their carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide levels in the blood increase. And this carbon dioxide easily diffuses into the cerebral spinal fluid in your brain. And so because of this, it's going to lower your pH and that can stimulate the respiratory center. And then this increased rate and the depth of respirations would be like the hyperventilation right? So if we have high CO2, that means we have low O2. So yeah, you're going to want to, right, to, in order to get more oxygen in and get rid of that CO2. And this, in a, when it can cause a problem, can cause respiratory acidosis and therefore nervous system, system depression. Because when you have the lower pH, that's acidic, right? And so this is respiratory related that's causing the acid content. So that's why it's respiratory acidosis. And whenever your body tanks outside of your normal physiologic norm, then it can cause a lot of problems. And this one happens to be the nervous system depression. 
Um, hypoxemia would mean a marked decrease in oxygen where the chemoreceptors respond. And um, there's an important control mechanism in individuals with chronic lung disease, and this moves them into a hypoxic drive, okay? So um, hypoxemia is not very good because you need oxygen to live. Um, here is the picture of hypoxic drive, and this is figure 13.4 in your book. And so um, basically here, it's on page 278 again, you have your hypoxic drive with the chronic elevated PCO2 levels, um, for instance, in emphysema. And so this has causes a chronic elevation of carbon dioxide levels, and that causes your chemoreceptors in your uh, medulla to become insensitive to high levels of PCO2. And so because of that, the PCO2 increases, and then the PO2 is going to decrease, because if CO2 increases, the O2 has to decrease. There's only room for one or the other. And so then because of it, you have no increase in respiration. Then you can have a marked decrease in oxygen levels. This can cause very low PO2 um, to stimulate the peripheral chemoreceptors. This can cause inspiratory muscles to be stimulated and then increase respirations. This can remove CO2 and take in more O2. And then the PCO2 decreases, causing the PO2 to increase respiration slow down and the cycle repeats and so this is a, a bad thing right because we need to actually have oxygen to live and stay healthy um what about hypocapnia well this is caused by low carbon dioxide concentration or a low partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the blood and this may be caused by hyperventilation because excessive amounts of carbon dioxide can be expired and um, this can also cause respiratory alkalosis because, again, it's like if you remember back to like the Bohr effect and myoglobin, hemoglobin, blood transport and all that stuff, um, you know, when we're more acidic, we tend to be in the tense state. The tense state causes the um, hemoglobin to release the oxygen that it's been carried. Right. And then it's like more acidic when you're in the tense state. So like all of this with the pH scale going in there, you know, anytime that we're decreasing oxygen, that's going to cause you to be a little bit more in the acidic state. Therefore, in the tense state, therefore releasing oxygen. Um, so reducing oxygen and increasing CO2 levels. Right. And then again, whenever we tank that pH, it can lead to acidosis. Um, so what about gas exchange? So gas exchange starts on page 278. So the uh, gas exchange is the flow of gases between the alveolar air and the blood. Um, and this is called external respiration, where gas exchange um, also is going to depend on the relative concentration or the partial pressures of the gases. The PO2 is the partial pressure of oxygen, where the PCO2 is a partial pressure of carbon dioxide. And each gas in a mixture moves along its partial pressure gradient, independent of other gases. And this is um, called Dalton's Law. So these are posted on my YouTube channel. If you guys are interested in those, I taught those in biochemistry. So there are videos um, for Baker Biochem that have Dalton, Dalton's laws and all those things too. So um, if I think about it, I'll link them, but it's not required. But if you want to learn more about it, there I do have videos on, on this channel, the Janet Miller 1999 one. All right, so what about pulmonary capillaries around the alveolus? Um, this is figure 13.5, and it's just, um, that's on page 279. So basically, it's showing you that it's very well vascularized, and your alveoli are the little pockets, and then you have your pulmonary arteries, right? The small ones are called arterioles, and then this blood is coming from the right ventricle. And then when you oxygenate it, so blue is unoxygenated, and then the red is reoxygenated, okay? And the oxygen exchange is happening there in the alveoli and in the capillary beds then the blood is going to be oxygenated and it's going to return to the left ventricle through the pulmonary venule. Okay. So um, this is where your gas exchange is really occurring. Um, looking at a cross section of the alve alveoli, you can just see how much the red blood cells, it's elastic, uh, the capillary, so it's very well um, uh, vascularized, right? It's very, it, it has to have vascularization. There has to be have access to um, you know the the blood because this is where we do the oxygen exchange. 
So um, you have that surfactant producing cell so that things can um, break down and not stick together. You have that layer of surfactant that you need. Um, you have the alveolar macrophages that try to take care of any invaders of particulate matter that comes in there. Um, again, you have your red blood cells, you have elastic fibers, you have your, um, you know, the uh, alveolar themselves are made from squamous epithelial cells. So what about the diffusion of gas? This again is figure 13.5 um, on page 279. And so you have your inspired ha air is your PO2 is about 160. Your PCO2 is about 0 0.3. It comes in through the lungs. And then you have this exchange through the pulmonary artery, right? Where we have the diffusion of CO2 goes into the alveolus. And then your expired air is going to have picked up that CO2 and drop off some oxygen, right? And so um, your red blood cell then is going to be really important to keep traveling. And so then it's just going to change the um, PO2 down here to 105 from 120, where your PCO2 is goes to 40 from um, 27. So you can see that the pressure is really going to be driving this exchange. And it's really important. And it happens all in the alveolus which is very closely, um, you know, in location to the venules, right? The arteries, the little babies, capillaries. Um, so there are different factors that affect the diffusion of gases. Um, one is the partial pressure gradient, um, the thickness of the respiratory membrane, the fluid accumulation in the alveoli or the in, uh, interstitial tissue. These can all impair gas exchange because um, you're just not gonna have like the space that you need to do it, right? The total surface area uh, available for diffusion is also very important because if part of an alveolar wall is destroyed, the surface area is reduced, and so there would be less exchange that would be occurring. You also have a ventilation perfusion ratio, and this is the ventilation of the airflow um, and the perfusion, which is the blood flow, and they need to match for maximum gas exchange. Um, so, what about the transport of carbon? dioxide and oxygen. Well, um, oxygen is about 1% of oxygen is dissolved in our plasma. Most of it is bound reversibly to hemoglobin, and then the binding and the release of oxygen to the hemoglobin does depend on the PO2, PCO2 temperature, as well as pH. Our carbon dioxide is a waste product that comes from cellular metabolism. About 7% of it is dissolved in plasma, where about 20% is reversibly bound to hemoglobin, and most diffuses straight into the red blood cells. Um, here is the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve, and this is figure 13.6 um, in your book on page 280. And so um, this is just showing about how pH affects affinity, okay? Affinity is a fancy word for attraction. So like myoglobin, for instance, has a very high affinity for oxygen. It loves it, it loves to store it. Where hemoglobin, it's really based on its pH. And so if it's very acidic, it has a low affinity or a low attraction to oxygen. Or if it's more basic, then it has a higher affinity um, to oxygen. So up here, you can see in the um, lighter purpley color, it has increased affinity. Um, acute alkalosis is going to cause an increase in pH, so we're more basic. This causes a decreased PCO2. Um, also, a decreased temperature. This can have low levels of 2,3-BPG. Um, Carboxyhemoglobin, uh, methyloglobin, um, and then the abnormal hemoglobin would cause like a left shift where your normal is going to be the solid line in between um, and then more acidics down here in the dark purple more basic is in the lighter purple um, when you have a decreased affinity this is um, potentially because of uh, acute acidosis where we have a drop in ph also high pco2 um, increased temperature high levels of 2,3 dpg um, and abnormal hemoglobin uh, shift to the right okay so basically, reading the caption, it says um, oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. This graph illustrates factors affecting the bond between oxygen and hemoglobin. The steep slope of the curve on the left represents the rapid dissociation of oxygen from hemoglobin as blood circulates through the tissues. This oxygen diffuses, diffuses into the cells. 
The flat portion of, portion of the curve at the top of the graph illustrates the binding of oxygen with hemoglobin in the lungs. And the lighter colored section above the line marked normal shows the effect of increased inf inf affinity where more oxygen is bound to hemoglobin. And this is termed a shift to the left. The darker area below the normal line shows a shift to the right and the condition in which more oxygen is dissociated from hemoglobin moves into the cells. Okay. Well, the case of the odds. All right, what about diagnostic tests? This starts on page 280. Um, the most common one is spirometry. And this is where they do a pulmonary function test, or PFT for short. And this is where they test pulmonary volumes and airflow times. Again, I've had these done. Um, not super fun, but whatever they are, what they are. You can also do arterial blood gas determination, and this is going to check your oxygen levels, your carbon dioxide levels, your bicarb levels, as well as your serum pH. You can have your oximetry, and this would be measuring your oxygen saturation. You can also do like stress test, uh, exercise tolerance testing, and this would be for patients with chronic, chronic pulmonary disease. You can also have radiography, and this is helpful in evaluating if there's a presence of tumors. This also evaluates infections. Uh, bronchoscopy is going to be performing a biopsy um, of the bronchioles and also check the site for lesions or bleeding. You can also have culture and sensitivity tests, and this is where you um, test the sputum or your spit for the presence of pathogens. And then you can use this to determine antimicrobial sensitivity of that pathogen. Looking at general manifestations of respiratory diseases, um, one is sneezing, right? And so this is on page 281. Um, so sneezing, you would think, isn't really a, a bad thing, but I mean, in excess, it can be uh, a, it can be bad. And then, but sneezing itself is a reflex to an irritation in the upper respiratory tract, and this assists in removing an irritant. And this is also associated with inflammation or, or foreign material. So think of, again, go into a dusty barn, or like I use a different perfume and my husband's allergic to it. He starts sneezing. That's one of his, um, he's allergic to like life and me. <laughs> But yeah, so sneezing is one of your first lines of respiratory defense. Sorry, I gotta get my lemonade in. Um, also coughing. This is an irritation caused by nas nasal discharge uh, with an inflammation of foreign material in the lower respiratory tract, and this can be caused by inhaled irritants. So I was riding Harley today, and he was coughing all the time, actually quite violently. So. I think she needs to probably get the bed out to see him because he was, he was causing a problem, but it was because he was irritated. We have here of your sputum, and this is basically your spit, right? If it's yellowish green, cloudy, or thick mucal uh, con content, then this would often indicate that there is a bacterial infection. If it's rusty or dark colored, then that's usually a sign of pneumococcal pneumonia. If there's very large amounts of uh, purulent sputum with a foul order, odor, then this may be associated with bronchiotysis. Um, you can also have thick, tenacious mucus, and this can be due to asthma, cystic fibrosis. Um, if it's blood-tinged blood -tinged sputum, this may result from a chronic cough, and it also may be a sign of a tumor or TB. Um, you can have hemoptysis, and this would be where it's blood tinged uh, which, with bright red frothy sputum, and usually this is associated with pulmonary edema. Um, breathing patterns and characteristics can be eupenia, which is a normal rate, or cosmal respirations, and this would be deep rapid uh, respirations, and this would be typical for acidosis, and this may follow um, strenuous exercises as well. Some breathing patterns and characteristics continued um, would be uh, labored respiration or prolonged inspiration or expiration. This is often associated with obstruction of airways. Um, you can also have wheezing or whistling sounds, and this can indicate the obstruction of small airways. You can also have stridor, and these are high-pitched crowing noises, and usually this indicates upper respiratory obstruction. Looking at this um, figure, this is figure 13.7 in your book on page 281, and this is respiratory patterns. And so you can have eupenia, which is rhythm is smooth and even, 
um, with expiration longer than the inspiration. Uh, you can have tachypnea, which is rapid uh, superficial breathing, <laughs> right? Regular or re irregular. You can have bradypnea, which is really slow. You can have apnea, which is you're not breathing. You can have hyperpnea, which is increased depth of respiration with normal to increased rate and regular rhythm. You can have Cheyenne strokes of respiration. You can have ataxic breathing, Kazmal's re respiration, epinusis, or obstructed breathing, right? So that shows you um, what they should look like in a diagram. Um, so breath sounds, when we have some problems, it, you can have rails, and this would be light, bubbly, or crackling sounds with serous secretion. You can have um, ronchii, and these are deeper or harsher sounds from a thicker mucus. You can also have absence, and this is a non-aeration or a collapse of the lung. You can have dyspnea, and this would be a subjective feeling of discomfort, and it may be caused by increased carbon dioxide or hypoxia. Uh, hypoxia. Um, this is often noted on exertion such as climbing stairs. You're out of breath, right? Um, severe dyspnea is indicative of respiratory distress. Um, sometimes you can get the, the flaring nostrils, um, the use of uh, accessory respiratory muscles, and also retraction of muscles between or above the ribs. You can have orthopenia, and this can occur when you're laying down, and it's usually caused by pulmonary congestion. Um, dyspnea, uh, continued is going to be proximal nocturnal dyspnea, and this is where you have a sudden acute type of dyspnea, and this is common in patients with left-sided congestive heart failure. You can have cyanosis. This is bad. This is when you have a bluish coloring of the skin and mucous membranes, and this is caused by large amounts of that unoxygenated hemoglobin in the blood, so you kind of are cyanotic color is the, the blue color of death. Not very good, right? Um, or poisoning. Uh, pleural pain, and this can result from the inflammation or the infection of the uh, parietal pleura. You can have a friction rub, and this is a soft sound that is produced uh, as a rough, inflamed, or scarred pleural move um, against each other. You can have clubbed digits, and this can result from chronic hypoxia associated with respiratory or cardiovascular diseases, and this is because it's uh, pain painless firm fibrotic enlargement at the end of the digit. Um, you can have changes in arterial blood gases, like where you have hypoxia, which is inadequate oxygen in the blood, or hypercapnia, which is increased carbon dioxide in the blood. Um, this is a nice table of basic therapies for respiratory disorders. This is table 13.2 in your book on page 283. And so it tells you the treatment, the effect, and an example. So basically, um, you know, how do we treat cigarette smoke, okay, or industrial pollutants? Well, you avoid inhaling the irritants and maintain good ventilation, and the effect would be that we would end up reducing the inflammation and infection. So that's a great little summary table. Moving on to infectious diseases with the upper respiratory tract infections and lower respiratory tract infections. Um, the upper respiratory ones are going to be your common cold, sinusitis, epiglottitis, influenza, and scarlet fever. Um, specifically talking about the flu, you know, we're in the middle of COVID, so honestly the flu hasn't quite been as bad this year. I think it's because people are actually like wearing masks and stuff and they're staying away from, um, you know, transpiring germs and stuff because of the masks and whatnot. Um, but this is a viral infection. There are three groups of influenza viruses. Um, type A is the most prevalent, but we also have types B and C. And um, the thing with like the flu vaccination, et cetera, is the, the, it's a virus, right? It's constantly mutating. And so it causes so many problems. And it's like a crapshoot and a guess on which variants are going to be out that year to put in the vaccine. I'm sure we've all had the flu before, um, and it can cause a sudden acute onset um, with fever, marked fatigue, aching in the body, um, and uh, just not very overall pleasant. It may also cause viral pneumonia. Mild cases of influenza may be complicated by secondary bacterial pneumonia, and then commonly the deaths in flu epidemics result from pneumonia that can potentially result from this. I actually got my second COVID shot today, and so um, some of the side effects can be flu-like. So I got it today at 1040, 
and it is 5.30 right now. Knock on wood. So good, right? So I spent the rest of the day, I was out riding horses and getting some fresh air. Just took a shower, so I'm all dried out, sorry. And my husband got it too, and he's so far so good. He's sitting, um, watching movies and drinking a beer. I'm a little jealous. All right. Um, do, 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 do. Um, so treatment, some, uh, symptomatic and supportive. So, you know, we, you know, there's like a double edged sword. You don't really want to fight the fever because the fever is fighting it off, but people don't like having fevers. So then they kind of want it to be fought off. And so, you know, it's kind of like a catch 22. So we want to support you and make sure that you're not, um, you know, having really bad problems with the symptoms. So you can use antiviral drugs. Um, or you can obviously prevention is the best cure, right? It's highly recommended. Um, respiratory hygiene, don't sneeze on people. It, ama it amazes me how many people still just sneeze out there, not sneezing into their elbow or, you know, whatever. And then vaccination is highly recommended. I personally don't get the flu shot, but maybe after all this COVID stuff is over, I'll start getting it. Who knows? Um, so your lower respiratory tract infections include uh, bronchiolitis, pneumonia, severe acute respiratory syndrome, TB, uh, histoplasmosis, as well as anthrax. Classifications of pneumonias are based on causative agents such as viral, bacterial, or fungal. Um, the anatomical location of the infection, um, so if it's throughout both lungs, if it's consolidated to one lobe, etc. The pathophysiologic changes, which would be like the changes in the interstitial, interstitial tissue, um, the alveolar septae or the alveoli, and also epidemiologic data, um, where if it's nosocomial, where, I mean, again, acquired in a hospital, or if it's uh, community acquired is a table talking about the different types of um, pneumonia. <clears throat> this is table 13.4, and this is on page 287 of your book. So you have globular pneumonias, you can have bronchial pneumonias, and then you can have interstitial pneumonias. So it's distribution cause pathophysiology onset signs. So that's a great little summary table to study up on. Um, your types of pneumonia, this looks like it is on page um, 288 hmm. um, and this is talking about basically the different types and where they're going to be affecting it so uh, again a little bit of anatomy this is your trachea the apex or the tip of the lung you can have your left superior lobe so down here in number one you can have bronchial pneumonia so it would be in the bronchioles and this is a diffuse type um, that's occurring again in those little baby tiny nodes in the bronchioles um, in two here, you can have lobular pneumonia, and this is where you have a consolidation of bacterial, and this a lot of times is with pleurosy. Then up here in number three is the primary atypical pneumonia is interstitial, and this is due to either viral or microplasmic um, reasoning. Okay. Um, so yeah, you can see the different parts that it affects in your lungs. Um, so specifically about uh, bacterial pneumonia, um, or the lob lobular pneumonia, um, so this is a community-based and it's often found in healthy young adults and it's usually caused by streptococcus pneumoniae. Uh, this infection is localized in one or more lobes and the inflammation and vascular congestion um, causes exudate to form in the alveoli. And then this exudate, which is going to come out like it's exuded right it contains fibrins and also it forms a consolidated mass and it produces a rusty sputum so when you cough it up it's going to be like the rusty brownish color right um the adjacent pleurae are frequently involved just because of proximity and then the infection may also spread to that pleural captivity um the epimia this is a picture of the um, pneumococcal pneumonia, and this is figure 13.11, and this is on page 289 of your book. Looks like it's just an H&E stain, um, and it's the bronchus and the surrounding alveoli that contain the neutrophils. 
manifestations are going to be it's sudden onset. Uh, the systemic signs are going to be high fever and chills, fatigue, leukocytosis. Uh, you have the dyspenia, the tachypnea, tachycardia that can all occur. You can also have uh, pleural pain. You can have the rails, the, that sound. Um, you can have a productive cough that's going to produce that typical rusty colored sputum. And then this can also cause confusion and disorientation. Looking at the uh, pictures of what the actual lungs look like, this is that same um, page 288, figure 13.10. And over here, this is showing you um, B and C. So B is the bronchial pneumonia, and this would be a gross section of the lung showing patchy areas of consolidation and pus-filled bronchioli, which are what these area arrows are pointing to. Where C over here is showing lobular pneumonia, where an entire lobe is uniformly consolidated, and this is the lighter color um, due to the accumulation of the inflammatory exudate within the alveoli. Um, you have bronchial pneumonia, and this is a diffuse pattern of infection in, that occurs in both lungs. And there are several species of microorganisms that may be the cause. Um, you have the inflammatory exudate that forms in the alveoli. The onset tends to be insidious, and it can cause moderate fever, cough, and again, that rails. Um, productive cough with the putrulent sputum, and usually this sputum is going to be yellow or green and how to treat it would be through antibacterial treatments. Okay, and this again is going to be that same lung that we showed, um, just the thing with the arrows are going to be those little plus stacks. All right, so specifically talking about Legionnaires, um, this is on page 289. Uh, so Legionnaires disease is a pneumonia caused by gram-negative bacterium, Legionella pneumoniophilia, uh, the microbe th thrives in warm, moist environments such as air conditioning systems or spas. It arises as a nosocomial infection in hospitals or other institutions, especially among those with other lung disease. It was known, or it was unknown, until a number of deaths occurred in the convention uh, in a convention in 1976. The microbe has been difficult to identify because the organism is found inside pulmonary macrophages, macrophages, and requires a special culture medium. Um, if it's untreated, the infection causes severe congestion and consolidation with necrosis or like the death in the lung and possibly um, it, you can have fatal consequences as well. Um, you have primary atypical pneumonia and this is caused by mycoplasmum pneumonia. Again, it's a bacterial cause and this is the one that's going to be co common in older children and young adults. It can be transmitted through aerosolization, right, the droplets. So this also is going to present with frequent cough and it's going to need antibiotic therapy. Um, the viral form can be caused um, by influenza A or B, also from an adenovirus or RSV. Okay. Um, uh, it, it has an unproductive cough when it has a hoarseness in your voice, also a sore throat, headache, mild fever, and malaise. <laughs> that sounds like a normal day for me. Just kidding. All right. And then we also have infection that varies greatly in severity, and the infection is usually self-limiting. You know, you guys probably think I'm so corny. I don't even know if you guys watch these. I do look at the um, the stats and see that people watch them, but hopefully you laugh a little bit <laughs> at my dorkiness, right? But... Okay, so uh, pneumonitis, carney pneumonia, this is on page 289. This is um, abbreviated PCP, and this is a type of atypical pneumonia. It occurs um, as an opportunistic, and then often it's a fatal, a fatal infection in patients with AIDS. And it also causes pneumonia in premature infants. And this microbe is formally classified as a protozoan, but it's now considered a fungus. And it appears to be inhaled and it attaches to the alveolar cells, causing necrosis and diffuse interstitial inflammation. Then the alveoli fill with exudate and fungi, including system form. Um, the onset is marked by difficulty in breathing and also non-productive cough. And then for AIDS patients with low CD4, CD4 T cell counts, the prophylactic drugs such as um, sulfamethylazone trimethoprim combination or the pentamide aerosol are also recommended.
Um, TB, this is one that you in the nursing um, profession is going to have, you have to get regularly tested for it, right? So this one is um, uh, one that's around still. So this is talked about on page 290. And so the cause is from a mycobacterium tuberculosis, and this is transmitted through oral droplets from persons with an active infection. Infection, And this occurs more frequently with people living in crowded uh, conditions, think of jails, hospitals, right? Uh, populations with immunodeficiencies, uh, malnutrition, alcoholism, conditions of war, chronic disease, and also those with HIV infection. Usually it's caused by M. tuberculosis, and unfortunately this is somewhat re resistant to drying and also to many disinfectants, um, and it can survive in dried sputum for weeks. Right? That's scary. Um, it can be destroyed by UV light, heat, alcohol, glutaraldehyde, or formaldehyde, and um, a normal neutrophil response does not occur. And it's because of that, we have cell mediated immunity that offers our protection normally. It primarily affects the lungs, and other organs may also be invaded. Um, with the primary infection, it's asymptomatic. When the organism first enters the lungs, it's going to be engulfed by those macrophages, our little Pac-Mans, and um, this causes local inflammation. If the cell mediated immunity is inadequate, then the mycobacteria reproduce and begin to destroy the lung tissue. And this form of disease is very contagious. Um, you can have a secondary um, or a reinfection with TB, and this occurs when the client's cell-mediated immunity is impaired because of either stress, malnutrition, HIV infection, or age. Um, age. Um, you also have mycobacteria that begin to reproduce and infect the lung. And in active TB, again, this can be spread to others. Sign and symptoms in the secondary or the active uh, stage is anorexia. You're not going to want to eat. Um, you have malaise, fatigue, because of all of these, you have weight loss. Um, you have an afternoon low-grade fever and night sweats that develop. The cough is prolonged and becomes increasingly severe, and as the cavitation develops, then it is more productive, and the sputum becomes purulent and often contains blood. If the cell-mediated um, immunity is adequate, then some bacilli are going to be able to migrate to those lymph nodes, this is a granuloma um, formation that occurs in the uh, tubercle, which contains the live bacilli, and this would wall it off and become calcified. Then the tubercle may be visible, visible on the chest radiograph, so that'd be great for diagnostics. Um, the bacilli may remain viable in the dormant stage for years. Again, very scary. Um, the individual's resistance and immune responses um, would be high, and the bacilli remain walled off. You can have a primary or the latent, like kind of sleepy infection, where the individual has been exposed and infected, but it does not have the disease and it's asymptomatic. You can also have an individual that cannot transmit the disease um, in this um, type. So here is the development of TB, and this is figure 13.12 on page 291 in your book. So here you have the inhalation of the mycobacterium tuberculosis in your lung, and you have your inflammatory response or a delayed hypersensitivity reaction that can lead um, to an individual with high resistance, um, leading to primary infection uh, in the formation of that turbicol, right? Or you can have productive or positive TB test, and the bacilli to lymph nodes, type 4 immune response can occur. This can have um, cause people with low resistance to have cavitation and have the in um, or the active infection. Okay. Um, and then you can have a dissemination through the lungs and other organs. Okay. And then again, TB, uh, the tubercle formation can um, cause the cessation of necrosis and uh, granuloma. And then the organisms are well off, called a gone complex. And this can cause a secondary or a reinfection. And if the resistance decreases later um, because of immune suppression, then the organisms can be reactivated. Okay. Um, also, what about like with military or extra pulmonary tuberculosis? So this is a rapidly progressive form 
which multiple granulomas affect large areas of the lungs and it rapidly disseminates into the circulation um, to other tissues, such as um, bone or kidney. This form of infection is more common in children and immunosuppressed adults. And if the patient with extra pulmonary TB has no cough, then she or he is not considered to have a contagious disease. Okay, and um, this is discussed more on page 291, but again, it's rapidly progressing form common in children um, under five years of age. Um, then the lesion's not found, it's not contagious. The common symptoms include the weight loss, failure to thrive, and other infections such as measles. Um, when we're talking about active TB, um, which would be primary or secondary, then the, um, then the organisms are going to multiply, forming large areas of necrosis, and this can cause large open areas in the lung, which is called cavitation. Cavitation promotes um, the spread into other parts of the lungs, and then the infection may spread into the pleural cavity. This can cause cough, positive sputum, and radiographs showing that cavitation. And then this disease in this form is highly infection when, infectious, when there is uh, close personal contact um, over a period of time. Here is um, uh, showing the cavitation, okay? And so this is on page 292, and this is figure 13.13. So this is a secondary pulmonary tuberculosis showing cavitation and scarring at the apex of the upper right lobe. Okay. So how do we diagnose these? Well, um, the first exposure or primary infection can be indicated by a positive skin test, tuberculin skin test, the ones that you, they poke you with. Um, if we have an active infection, then we can do an acid fast sputum test. You can do chest radiograph. You can do sputum cultures as well as sensitivities to detect. Um, how do we treat it? Well, long-term treatment with a combination of different drugs, um, the length of treatment varies anywhere from six to 12 months. Effective treatments require monitoring and following up, and it can be very expensive. Um, TB is becoming an increasingly serious problem because people are can be homeless or they can be crowded in shelters. Um, there's an increase in HIV protection. There's a lack of health care for people in certain socioeconomic um, areas. Um, and then also we have a multi-drug resistant forms of TB around as well. So how do we do treatment? Um, so this is on page 292. So although a person with latent TB, um, there may, may be an asymptomatic, there is higher risk groups where the preventative regimen is recommended to prevent the disease from becoming fully active form of TB. And the primary regimens include um, using um, ionosade, which is um, abbreviated INH, rifampanidine, and rifampin. Um, so with active tuberculosis, it's now usually treated at home or in a general hospital. Long-term treatment is uh, with a combination of drugs that's recommended so as to totally eradicate the infecting microbes and reduce the risk of the resistant bacteria. The length of the treatment varies from six months to a year or longer, depending on the situation. Drugs of choice include these guys, um, isonazide, rifampin, erythrobutol, right, streptomycin, et cetera. What about with obstructive lung disease? Um, this would be things like um, cystic fibrosis, lung cancer, aspiration, obstructive sleep apnea, right, and asthma. So these are detailed on page 294 of your book. Um, talking specifically about cystic fibrosis, this is an inherited genetic disorder that is located on chromosome 7. Um, this is where tenacious mucus forms from the exocrine glands, and this primarily affects um, the lungs and pancreas. Uh, in the lungs themselves, you have the mucus that's going to obstruct airflow in the bronchioles and the small bronchioli or bronchi. Um, this causes the permanent damage to the bronchial walls, and infections are also common. The commonly uh, infection, common infections are caused by Pseudomonas uh, aerogosia and Staphylococcus aureus. Um, it also has pro um, causes problems with the digestive tract, and this is where you have meconium ileus in newborns. Um, you can also have blockage of the pancreatic ducts, obstruction of the bile ducts, and also the salivary glands often can be mildly affected. Um, the reproductive tract 
can cause obstruction of the vas deferens in the male as well as obstruction in the cervix in the female and also it can affect your sweat glands because sweat has high sodium chloride content and so it can be affecting this um, this is a table of cystic fibrosis. This is on page 295, and it's figure 13.5. So up here you have cystic fibrosis, which is an autosomal recessive disorder, leading to exocrine gland, gland dysfunction, and that can lead to excessive amounts of thick, sticky mucus, and that can obstruct the ducts and the exocrine glands. Or it can also lead to sweat glands, which cause ex excess sodium or chlorine um, chloride content, and this can lead to electrolyte imbalance and dehydration. Um, that mucus can have effects on the lungs, which can cause obstruction of the airways and frequent infections. It can also cause fibrosis and core pulmonare um, in the reproductive tract. It can cause obstructions of the vas deferens, um, which can block the sperm flow. It can also have a cause cervical mucus to block sperm entry, and therefore that can lead to infertility. It can also have an effect on the digestive tract, and this is where the meconium ileus, or the intestinal obstruction, occurs in a newborn. Um, it can lead to obstruction in the pancreatic dust, ducts, therefore leading to fibrosis, fibrosis and diabetes mellitus. It can also have obstruction in the bile ducts of the liver, and this can lead to biliary cirrhosis, and both of these can lead to malabsorption and malnutrition. Signs and symptoms is the meconium ileus may occur at birth. You can have salty skin, and this can lead to um, performing a sweat test in the diagnostics uh, test of cystic fibrosis. You can have signs of malabsorption um, with, uh, with steerotheria or an abdominal abstention distension. You can have chronic cough and frequent respiratory infections, and these tend to increase over time. You can also have a failure to meet normal growth milestones. How do we diagnose? Um, well, this is starting on page 295 and it's really being talked about in page 296. So you can do genetic testing, you can do the sweat test, you can test the stool, you can use radiographs um, and pulmonary function tests, and also you can do blood gas analysis. Um, the treatment, we use an interdisciplinary approach. There's not just one specific treatment. We treat lots of things together. Um, so replacement therapy and well-balanced diet is needed. And then also you can have chest physiotherapy because since you're having a hard time breathing and opening up those lungs, that can be very helpful. Um, moving on to lung cancer, this is on page 296. About 90% of cases are related to smoking and you have bronchiogenic carcinoma. And this is the most common type of primary malignant lung tumor. And this arises from the bronchial epithelial cells. You can also have squamous cell carcinoma. And this usually develops from the epithelial lining of a bronchius. And the adenocarcinoma carcinomas and the bronchial alveolar cell carcinomas are usually found in the periphery of the lung. This is a picture um, that is from figure 13.16 in your book on page 297. And this shows the bronchiogenic carcinoma. You can see the big growth here. Um, so what about lung tumor effects? Well, um, we need our lungs to be kind of very pliable, right? And so this obstruction of the airflow into the bronchius can cause abnormal breath sounds to occur and also dyspnea to occur. The inflammation and the bleeding surrounding the tumor can lead to uh, coughing, hemipatitis, and secondary infections. You can also have pleural effusion, hemothorax, or a pneumothorax. You can also have paraneoplastic syndrome, and this occurs when the tumor cells secrete hormones or hormone-like substances, and usually these are systemic effects of cancer. So um, some early signs and symptoms would be the persistent productive cough, a detection on a radiograph, um, hemopatysis, uh, pleural involvement, chest pain, hoarseness, uh, facial or arm edema, headache, dysphagia, or um, atelitis. We can also have systemic signs throughout the whole body, which would be weight loss, anemia, fatigue. You can have paraneoplastic syndrome, and this is indicated by signs of an endocrine disorder, and these are related to the specific hormone secreted. You can also have signs of metastases, and this would be like bone pain and cognitive deficits, 
in motor de de deficit deficits. All right. What are some of the diagnostic tests that we can um, use? Well, we would have to use specialized helical CT scans or MRIs, um, chest radiographies, bron uh, bronchioscopes, and biopsies, and media stenoscopy. Okay. Treatments can be, and these are discussed on page 298. Radio frequency ablation can be used to destroy small cell tumors. That's discussed more in uh, chapter 20. Surgical resection or a lobectomy can be performed on localized lesions. Chemotherapy and radiation can be used in conjunction with surgery or as a palliative treatment. Although many tumors are not responsive to such therapy, then you can also have photodynamic therapy where a chemical is injected and migrates to a tumor cell where it's activated by laser light and it's going to destroy the cancer cells. And this is sometimes effective. The prognosis is poor unless the tumor is in the very early stages of development. So what about asthma? Well, this is a bronchial obstruction and um, this occurs in persons that are hypersensitive um, or hyper responsive uh, airways. And this may occur in childhood or it can have a onset um, in the adulthood and it also can have a family history um, in those that have, um, you know, the family histories of allergic conditions. I'm trying to find it in your book. Um, you have extrinsic asthma and this is where you have um, acute episodes that are triggered by type 1 hypersensitivity reactions. And then you can also have intrinsic asthma. And this would be um, onset during the adulthood. You can have uh, hyper-responsive tissue in the airways that are going to initiate the attack. The stimuli can include respiratory infections, stress, um, exposure to um, uh, 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 cold, inhalation, or irritants, exercise, and also um, drugs. Okay. Um, so the pathophysiologic changes um, of the bronchioli and the bronchioles are going to be inflammation of the mucosa and edema, bronchial constriction, which is caused by a contraction of the smooth muscle, and also increased secretion of the thick muscles, uh, mucus, sorry, in the airways. And then these changes create obstructed uh, airways, either partial or total. Signs and symptoms can be coughing, uh, marked dyspnea, tight feelings in the chest, wheezing, rapid and labored breathing, expulsion of thick or sticky mucus, also tachycardia, so the rapid heart rate, and this may also include um, pulses paradoxus, and this is where the pulse differs on inspiration and expiration, and it can also lead to hypoxia. Um, you can also have respiratory alkalosis, and this is initially caused by hyperventilation. You can have respiratory acidosis, and this can be caused by air trapping. You can have severe respiratory distress, and this is where you have hypoventilation that leads to hypoxia and the respiratory acidosis, and you can also have respiratory failure, and this is indicated by decreasing um, responsiveness and also cyanosis. I'm going to pause here for a second. Okay, so this is figure 13.18, and this is on page 301 in your book. And so this is um, asthma and acute episode. And so basically you have the edema of the mucous membrane. It can form a mucus plug to form, it cause a mucus plug to form. Then you can have a bronchiospasm, which would be a muscle contraction. And this contraction here can lead to an obstructed bronchiole. Um, status asthmaticus, this is persistent severe attacks of asthma, and this does not respond to usual therapies, and this is considered a medical emergency. This may be fatal because severe hypoxia and acidosis can occur. Um, general treatment would be skin tests for allergic reactions, avoidance of the triggering factors, good ventilation of the environment, swimming and walking, uh, use of maintenance inhalers and drugs, as well as measures for acute tax are control your breathing techniques, um, use those bronchial dilator inhalers, and use also glucocorticoids. Um, some measures for status uh, asthmaticus is hospital care if they are not responsive to a bronchodilator. 
Um, prophylactic treatment would be, you know, using your inhalators when you need to, right? So use the leukotriene receptor antagonist to block the inflammatory responses that are present in the stimulus. Um, these are not always effective for treatment of acute attacks, but it's something to try. You can have chromalin sodium, and this is a prophylactic medication that is inhaled on a daily basis. This is useful for athletes and sport enthusiasts, and there's no value um, of, of using this during an acute attack. attack. You also can talk about chronic, chronic obstructive um, pulmonary disease, and this would be like emphysema, chronic uh, bronchitis, and bronchial cytosis. Um, this would be a group of chronic respiratory disorders that causes irreversible and progressive damage to the lungs. Um, it has debilitating conditions that may affect an individual's ability for work, um, and it may lead to the development of core pulmonary and respiratory failure can also occur. This is a um, table 13.5, and um, this is on page 303, and this is a summary of the chronic obstruct obstructive lung diseases. So you have your disease characteristics, so your etiology, location, pathophys, etc., of emphysema, chronic bronchitis, and asthma. So make sure that you go over those. Um, so speaking specifically about emphysema, this is where we have the destruction of the alveolar walls and the septae, and then this leads to large permanently inflated alveolar air spaces, and these are classified by specific location changes, and the contributing factors include genetic deficiency, genetic tendencies, cigarette smokings, as well as pathogenic bacteria. Um, so looking at um, the normal alveolus, right, you can see this is on page 304, and this is figure 13.9, and this would be a normal alveolus with respiratory bronchial and an alveolar ducts. You can see that they're nice and open and round, where in emphysema, you can see that we have an overinflated alveolus. You have the loss of the septae and the capillaries, and it kind of just becomes a big blob instead of individualized. And so because it's one big blob, you're going to decrease that surface area. The surface area is important for gas exchange, so that's CO2, O2, right? And also it's going to lose elastic fibers and um, therefore cause a decreased recoil. So you're not going to be able to breathe as well when you have emphysema because of this reduced recoil. It's not as pliable. It also has um, air trapping. And this, again, is on page 304. And um, basically, normal expiration, you would cause this recoil and we exhale. But when we have impaired expiration, then the damaged wall can collapse the airway and it can become obstructed. And then also you're going to have that loss of pliability or elasticity. And then because of that, you have increased residual volume and an overflated lung. So basically, you can't exhale. It's kind of like... Right, you, you just you can't quite exhale everything out. Um, you can also have a breakdown of the alveolar wall that results um, in again the loss of surface area for the gas exchange, the loss of pulmonary capillaries, the loss of elastic fibers, the altered ventilation and perfusion ratio, and also decreased support for other structures. The fibrosis can cause the narrowed airways, the weakened walls, and also it can interfere with the passive expiratory airflow. So this here is a picture of the normal lung um, on the top and then the alveoli, the dilated alveoli on the right, but it's really the bottom. Okay. So this again is going to be um, on page 304, figure 13.9. So it's progressively difficult to um, exhale and because of that air trapping and the increased residual volume, and this can cause an overinflation of the lungs and also the fixation of the ribs in a respiratory position. And this caused increased anterior posterior diameter of the thorax, which is called barrel chest. Think of if you like, and then you, you have to walk around like that and you can't make it smaller, right? It's always going to just be like this big barrel. And then because of that, it's going to look like you have flattened diaphragms um, on the radiographs, right, that you're, you're taking. Advanced emphysema uh, can, and loss of tissue, um, basically the adjacent damaged alveoli coalesce. 
group together, right? And they merge and then they form larger air spaces, which are those pockets that we just talked about. This can also lead to a pneumothorax. And this occurs when the pleural membrane surrounding the large blebs ruptures. This can also cause hypercapnia and this can become very distinct or marked. Um, hypoxia becomes the driving force of respiration, and then you can also have frequent infections. And also the pulmonary hypertension and the core pulmonary may develop in the late stage. Um, you have dyspenia, and this can occur first on exertion. You can have hyperventilation with prolonged ex expiratory phases, and this would be the development of that barrel chest. You can have anorexia and fatigue, which can cause weight loss. And then you can also have the signs and symptoms of those club fingers. So how do we diagnose this? Using chest radiographs as well as pulmonary function tests. Um, this is a picture of emphysema. Um, and so this is figure 13.21 in your book on page 306. And you can see just it really spongy looking in these like blobby um, things of the coalesced areas, and it's just not a very healthy looking um, lungs. So how do we treat this? Well, avoid respiratory irritants, um, get your shots against flu and pneumonia. Um, you also can do pulmonary rehab. You can have appropriate breathing techniques. You can have adequate nutrition and hydration, and this improves energy levels, also resistance to infection. You can have your bronchodilators, um, you can use antibiotics, oxygen therapy can also be used as the condition progresses and advances. And you can also have lung reduction surgery so that um, you're, you don't have such a big barrel chest. Um, with chronic bronchitis, this is on page 307. Um, this is where we have inflammation, obstruction, and repeated infection. Um, chronic coughing for twice um, for three months or longer in two years. And this also usually has a history of cigarette smoking or living in urban or industrial areas um, where there's a lot of smog and um, air pollution. The mucosa is inflamed and swollen. It can cause hypertrophy and hyperplasia of the mucous glands. You can also have fibrosis and the thickening of the bronchial wall. Um, this leads to low oxygen levels, severe dyspnea and um, fatigue, as well as pulmonary hypertension and poor pulmonal day. Um, the signs and symptoms would be your persistent um, cough, productive, constant productive cough. That means as you're coughing, crud's coming up, right? It's productive. It's producing some stuff that's coming up. You can have tachypnea and the shortness of breath. You can have frequent, thick, and purulent secretions. The cough and the ronchi are more severe in the morning because um, you've been laying and then you get up and then you have to like cough all this crap back up. Um, you can have hypoxia, cyanosis, hypercapnia, and this is caused by airway obstruction. You can have polycythemia, weight loss, or signs of poor pulmonale are possible. And then also as the vascular damage and pulmonary hypertension progresses, these things can get worse. How do we treat it? Well, stop smoking and reduce your exposure to the irritants. Um, treat the infections, vaccinate for prophylaxis, so for protection. You can have expectorants, so these are going to help you to, um, you know, cough up crap, right? You can use bronchodilators. Um, you can do appropriate chest therapy, which can include postural drainage and percussion. You can have low flow oxygen, that's constant, right, forcing it in. And also you can use nutritional supplements. Uh, bronchial tetysis is usually a secondary um, condition. This is irreversible abnormal dilation of the medium-sized bronchii, which would be the primary bronchii, and this may be saccular or elongated. This arises from recurrent inflammation and infection, and this leads to an obstruction of airways, the weakening of the muscle, and elastic fibers in the bronchial walls, or both. And this also has infecting organisms that are usually mixed, such as streptococci, staphylococci, pneumonococci, and um, H. fluenzae. Signs and symptoms are going to be your chronic cough, large amounts of sputum, rails, and the ronchii in the lungs, as well as foul breath dyspnea, hemoptysis, weight loss, anemia, and fatigue. And then the last slide would be treatment, which would be using antibiotics, bronchodilators, chest physiotherapy, 
as well as treatments of the pulmonary conditions. All right, we'll see you guys in lecture. Bye-bye.